It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry Lesseur and Don Hollenbeck, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest is Henry Ford Sink, Ordinary Delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. Mr. Ford, you're of course best known as an American industrialist. Can you tell us now how it feels to be a diplomat? Well, Mr. Lesseur, I really don't feel that I'm a diplomat. I've been asked uh, by the Secretary of State to come down here as an alternate delegate to the United Nations, and I've been assigned to the second committee, which is the Economic and Financial Committee, which actually has nothing to do with the diplomatic relations of the United States with any other country. We are principally concerned with economic and financial matters, and as you know, more particularly concerned with technical assistance up to this point. As a matter of fact, at this time, I am not representing our country. Uh, Mr. J.D. Zellerback of the Crown Zellerback Paper Corporation from San Francisco is representing us in the second committee on something called SunFed, which probably doesn't mean much to most of the citizens of this country, but which is now being discussed in the second committee. Would you spell that SunFed out? I think we all ought to know a little bit more about well, it. SunFed is S-U-N-F-E-D, yes. which is a special United Nations fund for economic development. What about the difference in procedure, though, from being a, a business administrator and from working around a table with a lot of people from different countries, Mr. Ford? Well, as a matter of fact, I think that uh, this is something that I have not had much experience with, but one which I have learned a great deal from, and I hope that I can contribute a little a bit to. Uh, in our business, of course, which is the only thing that I've had any experience with, and that is that uh, we are used to dealing with problems which all of us have had sort of similar backgrounds in dealing with. When we come here to the United Nations, or at least from my point of view, we are dealing with peoples from 60 different countries. People that have had different economic backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, different language backgrounds. And uh, for me, it's been a great education and a great experience to become uh, associated with those people and to face the problems which are facing the world. It's, it's a very thrilling experience and one which I think is very beneficial to the United States and I think the United Nations can mean great things for our country. What's the biggest problem in adjusting to that change? <laughs> well, experience, I experience. think. Experience. Experience well, is a l means a lot. Mr. Ford, uh, you've been concerned so far at the United Nations with this expanded UN program for technical assistance to underdeveloped countries. Uh, do you think this program is in our s American self-interest? <laughs> I think it definitely is. I think it uh, is new. It is spread thin. It only has $25 million, as you know, over seven to be spread over 70 different countries, and it involves several different agencies. And uh, the method in which it's administered is very important. But I think to many countries of the world, to many of the underdeveloped countries of the world, the United Nations is technical assistance. It's that thing which is brought to them, which is their life and death, the difference between life and death to them, health and food. And I think from that standpoint, it's very important. It's just as important as the bilateral, which is a technical expression, which we use in this country for the aid which the United States is giving in and of itself to the underdeveloped countries. But I think the United Nations also plays a very important part in that type of program. Well, in the long run, you think it will help the United States, though? I definitely do. Well, I've heard you quoted recently and seen you quoted as having some ideas in other lines of <coughs> help around the world which don't have to do with the United Nations. In other words, I'm going to get right down to business on tariffs. You've been having some publicity on some views of yours on that matter. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, <laughs> I've felt uh, uh, for quite a period of time that it's better for us to trade and not aid. I think that uh, in this country, uh, as, as a matter of personal opinion and speaking for myself, that uh, our people are, would rather pay less taxes and trade more than they have. 
And I think that if we can get reciprocal trade agreements, I think we must have an understanding with our foreign friends that they will help us if we will help them. And I think if we can have uh, a better trade picture, a lowering of our tariffs, and I think that if they will help us, we can have more trade, which will expand our economy. I think it's in our best self-interest. I think that uh, if <coughs> we can sell our excess production, not only in farm goods, but in our, in our hard goods industries, that we can do an awful lot for our country. And I think that it's in our best self-interest to do so. Well, Mr. Ford, certain parts of the business world, uh, we must acknowledge, didn't like some of your remarks about their desire for a closed market. How do you answer them? Well, I thoroughly agree. I think there are lots of people who don't agree with me at all, and I don't blame them. There are lots of people that I don't agree with, and I think we, we all have our certain interests in which we know better than other people. But I'm thinking, uh, as a matter of fact, in my estimation at least, for the benefit of the country as a whole, I think that it's far better for us to find some way to expand our trade so that we will not have to pay out our tax dollars in aid. Well, wouldn't this matter of lower tariffs work a hardship on some people in this it country? It may very well work hardships on certain segments of our economy, and I think that those segments should be definitely protected. I and think they should maybe have direct subsidy, a subsidy that we can measure, a subsidy that can be seen. As it is, we have a high protective tariff in many cases, which is unknown to the people of this country. There's no way to measure it. And I think if we reduce our tariffs and then can protect certain industries by direct subsidy, we'd be better off than having this umbrella. Well, what would uh, lower tariffs actually do for our economy, Mr. Ford? Well, in my estimation, uh, and I'm speaking for myself alone, lower tariffs would mean that it would enable us to uh, sell more of our goods overseas and return would allow other peoples who could earn American dollars to buy more from us, which would give them an opportunity to trade with us, which they are not now able to do because they don't have dollars. I mean, if we talk uh, free enterprise and competition here at home, we ought to uh, talk the same sort of language abroad, too. I think so. I'm for the freedom of the individual and for freedom of trade. <laughs> Could you be specific, perhaps, about many about any industry that might need uh, this protection or subsidy that you Well, I, I, I don't believe I'm in a position at this moment to talk about any particular industry. I, I'm not sure that I'm well enough informed to, to speak about any particular industry. Well, Mr. Ford, I know one industry that you're very well informed about. That's the automotive industry. You tell me, do you really think that uh, we've reached the saturation point of automobiles on the roads? I don't, I don't actually think we have. I think we, need, uh, I think we need more and better roads, and having uh, driven around the eastern part of the United States, I can see why many motorists would be exasperated with automobile have production. Have you tried to park moment. lately? <laughs> 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 the parkways on Sunday night in this area are really crowded. But I honestly think that uh, with... Uh, uh, an expanded sales organization and with the products which our industry has to sell that there's a great opportunity for us to do an even greater job than we've been able to do up to this point. Uh, I think we haven't really gotten into the really possibilities that are available for our industry. There are many families which don't own cars that can afford to own cars and there are many families that can afford to have two cars that only have one car. Well, Mr. Ford, what about the, uh, if I may say so, the automobile dealers? Aren't they screaming now about having too many cars on their hands? Many dealers? Many dealers are. I think many dealers are really worried that, that the manufacturers are turning out too many cars. I think that uh, since the war, the, the dealers really haven't had a uh, uh, competitive situation to face. And I know that they all want to face that situation, and now we're in it. And uh, so they've got to go out and sell, and I'm sure that the manufacturers as such want to treat them in the best way they possibly can, because no manufacturer is any better than his dealer organization. Mr. Ford, the cost of living is going up now. The index has reached its highest point since the Korean War. Do you think that uh, if labor demands higher wages now that uh, we can still maintain a decent cost of living in this country? Well, uh, I, I'm not sure that I can answer that uh, question, Mr. Lesser. In, uh, in the most economic sense, we in our business have a 
cost of living index, which is measured on the cost of living, and uh, as such, uh, we pay wages in accordance with the rise or the lowering of the cost of living. Uh, and uh, we will do that until our contract runs out in 1955. Uh, and that's our contract, so we're forced into it, and we're very willing and, and happy to live by it. A lot of people say that we're in danger of uh, overproduction in America and uh, a recession <laughs> is due. What do you think about it? Uh, I'm, I'm not worried about overproduction in this country, and I'm not worried about a recession. I think we have the greatest uh, country in the world. We have freedom of the individual, we have a love for peace, and we have the ability, I think, to expand our economy to unlimited scope. And I think that uh, if we all work together and we all try together, we have a great job to do for our country. We certainly want to win the peace. That's our primary objective. But I think that our economy can uh, expand even farther than, expand than it has expanded up to date. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Henry Ford. It's been a great pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry LeSeur and Don Hollenbeck, both of the CBS television news staff. Our distinguished guest was Henry Ford II, alternate delegate to the United Nations General Assembly. <coughs> Jewelers know that a fine watch, such as Longines, actually improves with use. Yes, long years after an inferior watch has virtually worn out and has been discarded, a Longines watch will continue to be an accurate and a dependable timepiece. So may I suggest that when you're planning the purchase of a very fine watch, this Christmas, for instance, first compare the facts about Longines with the facts you have about any other watches you may know. The facts reveal Longines as one of the very finest of the world's watches. In side-by-side -side competition with the best watches of the world, Longines is the only watch to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, highest honors for accuracy, and a position of preference in sports, aviation, and in science. The Longines watch of today is made with the skill and the experience of almost a century of fine watchmaking. It's endowed with those qualities of greater accuracy and longer life for which Longines watches are world-renowned. And yet, you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. <laughs> this is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.